Well, welcome to episode 172 of 10 Minute Record Reviews. And this time I'm going to talk about an album by Ramsey Lewis called Sun Goddess, which came out in 1974. And this is the first pressing of that record. And Ramsey Lewis is a guy that, uh, well, certainly if you dig through record bins, you'll find associated with a lot of that really sort of swinging 1960s pop jazz, a kind of cocktail party finger snapping kind of stuff. Uh, this is a whole different kind of an animal, this album. Uh, this is jazz funk. It's made not just by Lewis and his trio, but by another musician, Maurice White. And Lewis and White had formed a close bond when White was in Lewis's trio in the late 1960s. They go their separate ways. And then in the mid 70s, they reconnected as they both had found their way to a bit of a funkier space. It's airy, spacious, very inventive music with vocals, but not really a lot of lyrics, which is very typical, for instance, of Earth, Wind & Fire, and no great surprise, because most of the key players from Earth, Wind & Fire are actually on this record. So really, this is as much an Earth, Wind & Fire album as it is a Ramsey Lewis album. And if you like classic mid-70s jazz funk, people like Roy Ayers, stuff like that, you're going to love this record. So Ramsey Lewis was born in 1935 in Chicago, and I'll deal with his early life when I review his earlier records, but for now, suffice it to say that by the mid-1950s, he was in a series of jazz trios, he was in a trio called The Clefts, and then he formed his own trio, the Ramsey Lewis Trio, and on drums he's got Isaac Red Holt, and on bass he's got a guy called L.D. Young, and that trio was signed to Chess Records, began to make releases. The debut was in 1956 with the very 1956 album titled Ramsey Lewis and His Gentlemen of Swing. From the very beginning, that group, and really this characterizes Lewis's career as a whole, always mixed a pop element into jazz. The trio does okay for the better part of a decade, but in 1965, their big break happens when their album, The In Crowd, just soars up the charts. And this was a live album recorded in Washington, D.C. And The In Crowd, the single itself, gets to number five on the pop charts, and the album gets to number two on the pop charts, which is pretty rarefied error for a jazz record. Perhaps inevitably, with a bit of a taste of success, the bonds that had kept a young and ambitious band together begin to fray a little bit, and Young and Holt depart, and they go form Young Holt Unlimited. So Lewis has to form a new trio. Cleveland Eaton, who's a tremendous bassist, comes in on the four strings. But on drums, Lewis had heard a lot about this kid in Chicago who was playing a lot of session work, doing a lot of jingles, doing all kinds of stuff. He was basically the go-to drummer at that point. This guy's name is Morris White, one and the same, founder of Earth, Wind & Fire. So White and Eaton both joined Lewis's new trio in the fall of 1965. This trio, by all accounts, is really simpatico, and in particular, the relationship between White and Lewis was quite profound in that Lewis really mentored White in all facets, basically becoming a professional musician. White really looked up to him and learned a ton, and Lewis, in turn, constantly encouraged White, who we could see was a rare talent, to continually expand his abilities, his range of instruments that he mastered, and so on. And so it was a very fertile and progressive time for all of them. They had a fair amount of success in the late 1960s, but as White progressed and developed as a musician and really started to achieve his potential, you could really no longer contain a talent like that in someone else's trio. So he goes off in late 69 to form his own band, Earth, Wind & Fire. Based on his work with Ramsey Lewis to date, he gets a record deal pretty quickly with Warner Brothers. White's concept for Earth, Wind & Fire had a whole bunch of different influences. One of the key ones was Sly and the Family Stone, sort of a hard grooving band drawing from a whole bunch of kind of eclectic musical influences. And he also wanted the band to draw on multi-ethnic musical inspirations and have multi-ethnic appeal. They start off making a bit of a modest impact in the first couple of records. Their third album, Open Your Eyes, is their big breakthrough, and now they've really hit the big time. And so White, feeling that there's some kind of magic dust that he had going on, also reaches out to a guy he'd wanted to work with for a long time that he'd actually gotten to know back in Chicago when he was working with Lewis, and that is a guy called Charles Stepney, who is a fantastic producer and a fantastic arranger. Stepney Olds had a finger in a whole bunch of pies, including at the time being the musical director and the producer for a band called Rotary Connection. And these guys are a phenomenal group if you don't know about them, just as a sidebar. And their hits include a fantastic song called I'm the Black Gold of the Sun. They also featured a then unknown singer called Minnie Ripperton, who would go on, of course, in the latter part of the 70s to have a fantastic solo career. Maurice had always wanted to work with Stephanie again, so he brings him in, and Stephanie's able to take Earth, Wind and Fire just to another level through his arrangements, just bringing the best out of every musician. Meanwhile, back to Ramsey Lewis and his trio. Now, he'd had to fill a bit of a hole when Maurice White left, so he bought in a guy called Morris Jennings, a great player himself. And he'd also been working with Charles Stepney as he took his sound from that kind of pop jazz, finger popping kind of swinger sound of the 60s to a much funkier sound in the early 1970s. 
as I've mentioned in other reviews, this was a transition which a whole bunch of primarily black jazz musicians made in the late 1960s, partly because of a sense of a loss of audience. It was losing its place to rock and roll, to soul, and to funk. And the black audience in particular have been departing jazz, moving to those latter two categories in terms of what they listen to. So publisher perish, migrate or disappear, that was the choice. And so Lewis, along with a whole bunch of other black artists, had moved into a much funkier lane by the early 70s. So by 1974, Earth, Wind & Fire in a great vein of form, laying down tracks what would become the That's the Way of the World album in 1975, they had a few extra songs. And White felt that at least one of these, a track called Hot Dog It, was actually a pretty surefire hit. So he phones up Ramsey Lewis and says, look, I've got this material. If you want to record it, we can get together. Lewis says, great, let's do it. Let's get back together because they always enjoyed each other's company, professionally, musically, and so on. So later that summer, Maurice White, his brother Verdine, the bassist, the vocalist Philip Bailey, and the guitarist Johnny Graham, all from Earth, Wind & Fire, joined Stepney with Lewis and his trio in Chicago to make this record. It was recorded in Paul Serrano's studio, and the very first track they laid down was this instrumental that White was sure was going to be a hit, Hot Dog It. Once they finished that, White mentioned to Lewis that he actually has another instrumental. He wasn't really sure where it was going to go, felt it had a bit of a Latin groove that could be useful, and they may as well just record it. So they put down this other track, it was untitled at the time, eight minutes long, which eventually became the title track of this record, Sun Goddess. To finish the album, they recorded five other tracks, four of those written by Lewis, and one of them was written by Stevie Wonder, Living for the City. They rush out Hot Dog It as the first single, and nothing happens. Everyone's kind of disappointed, they were sure it was going to be a winner. What does happen though, and again, recall, this is the age of FM radio, that black radio stations began to play the deeper cuts in this record, and in particular began to play the title track, Sun Goddess, which became a huge hit. The album hit number one on the R&B charts, it hit number one on the jazz charts, it got to number 12 on the pop charts. So long live the album-oriented format. Side one starts with the aforementioned title track, and this is some sublime, Yacht Funk. It's got those fantastic, as I mentioned, non-verbal vocals from the Earth, Wind & Fire guys. There's this wonderful funky solo on sax from this guy they brought in, Don Myrick. The rhythm section, really the whole Earth, Wind & Fire contingent is just phenomenal here. The White Brothers on drums and bass, Philip Bailey on congas, Johnny Graham on guitar, just a totally consistent groove all the way through, and Lewis just floating in and out in the Fender Roads. This is just a trip. It's like a fabulous sunny afternoon with a top down. The next song is a Stevie Wonder cover where Ramsey's carrying the melody and you've got this fantastic work on bass by Cleveland Eaton. Once they deal with the head arrangement, the other real feature of this is this wah-wah electric piano work by Ramsey Lewis. It's superbly funky and they have this great distorted tone on the piano. The last song on side one is the first composition by Lewis in the record and this is Love Song which starts off with this slow funky beat, kind of in the same vein as a lot of the Philly sound from that particular era, which of course was very influential at the time, Philadelphia International Records and that whole sound. Side 2 starts with Jungle Strut, which is another track where Cleveland Eaton's bass is a major part of the song. It's got this really hooky riff that underpins the piano. There's another player here, Durf Reklau Rahim, who comes in on vocals, kind of a scat like no other in congas. This whole song in large measure is about the rhythm section and the vocals, but there is a nice little descending hook on synth played by Ramsey. Next is Hot Dog It, which is a song that White thought was going to be a hit. You can kind of see why he thought it'd be okay for Lewis, because it's a bit of a soul jazz piece, but strangely, given how cutting edge White really was in the musical world at the time, this song actually sounds a little bit dated to me, and I'm not too surprised it didn't do too well. Tambora is basically a showpiece for two people, Ramsey Lewis, first on the Arp synth and then on the Fender Rhodes, and Maurice Jennings on all kinds of different percussion. The final track, Gemini Rising, is the most obviously jazz track on the whole record, there's a whole bunch of mood changes here. At points, it becomes jazz fusion, pretty much. And it's yet another chance for Cleveland Eaton to really shine on the bass. This isn't a completely coherent record. There's a bit of a tension, which doesn't always work, between White's contemporary, airy funk, the kind of stuff he was doing with Earth, Wind & Fire, and the more traditional soul jazz, which was Lewis's stock and trade, which he was evolving from, but reveals itself every now and then. But tension or not, this is a record with many excellent songs, and in the title track, an iconic piece of mid-70s culture. It's also a hugely positive, uplifting album. If you're going to play this yacht funk in your yacht, it's going to be a happy voyage. It's one of, I think, the two real standout records of Ramsey Lewis's career, along with the in-crowd, and I give it four and a half out of five stars.